Incoming transmission. Welcome. 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 Welcome to True Spies. Week by week, mission by mission, you'll hear the true stories behind the world's greatest espionage operations. You'll meet the people who navigate this secret world. What do they know? What are their skills? And what would you do in their position? This is True Spies. In my estimation, this was one of his most astonishing operations because he found a way gradually, not right away, gradually, to get the heart of this woman who would not be seducible in the usual manner. This is True Spies. Episode 87, Stalin's Romeo Spy. The first time I met Bestralotov, under very unusual circumstances. I was a freelance journalist and my work was published in leading Soviet time publications like Izvestia and the uh, Evening Moscow and Labor and Soviet culture and, and many other. At home in Moscow, satirical journalist Emil Dreitza says his goodbyes and hangs up the telephone. His brow is furrowed. He's confused. I was very, very much surprised when I got one day, actually, as I recall it, as my record shows, September 10, 1973. I got a phone call from my father-in-law who said that his client would like to talk to me. His father-in-law is a tailor employed by the Soviet Ministry of Defense. And therein lies the source of Emil's confusion. Surely no client of his father-in-law would talk to the press about the ministry's business. This is Soviet Russia we're talking about, after all. Freedom of the press ranks low on the government's list of priorities, especially in regard to military matters. So I was very curious. And so I asked uh, my father-in-law, who is this man, why he won't... I said, I don't know, he was just a, a nice man. He, I talked to him about you. Now... Emil has the feeling that his father-in-law might have missed out some crucial information during his conversation with a mysterious client. Because while Emil is a journalist, he's primarily a satirist. He makes a living poking fun at the government, within limits, naturally. He probably just mentioned the newspapers, widely known titles of the names of newspapers uh, at that time. So... I don't know, he said, my father-in-law, here's his telephone, give him a call. Before long, confusion gives way to curiosity. Emil picks up the phone. So I called, just very, very curious. <laughs> Why? <laughs> Why he wants to talk to me? The man on the other end of the phone keeps the details vague. He just invited to come over to his apartment, which I did the next day, September 11, 1973. Which is how Emil found himself on the threshold of the modest Muscovite home of one Dmitry Bristrol Yotov, Stalin's Romeo spy. I saw an um, aged man with long, already grey beard, very cultured, who, upon my entrance, asked me to show my press ID. At that time, I was a member of the journalist of the Soviet Union. And he then treated me to tea and uh, started telling me about his life. As I was listening to him, I still to the end of the evening could not understand why he's telling me what he's telling me because nothing of what he was told me at that time was possible to publish in Soviet press. He told me about his life, how he was recruited as a Soviet spy while being in immigration in the West and about his work. The spy and the satirist spoke for hours. The older man spun a tale of glamour, tragedy and subterfuge between the wars. The younger man simply listened. What else could he do? So again, I was totally flabbergasted. Why the man tells me all of these things that not possible to even mention to somebody, needless to say, to put it in the press. So I came home and I wrote down 
whatever I remembered from our meeting. But interestingly enough, later on when I looked at, at my notes, I wrote I wrote everything in um, in ink. However, his name I put in pencil. An interesting creative choice. And why? I thought, my God, if by any chance a KGB comes to me <laughs> after, after learning about uh, his talk, at least I will be able to erase the name of the man. A little knowledge can be a dangerous thing, after all. So dangerous, in fact, that Emil had to wonder why the aging spy had decided to tell all. Now, looking back at a distance of almost half a century, he has a working theory. He never could tell the truth about all his life and what it amounts to. So therefore, it's like a man in a inhabited island puts a note in a bottle and throws into the ocean in hope that someday somebody will pick it up and learn about him. Within the next few months, Emil Dreitzer would be on a plane out of Soviet Russia, bound for the United States. And that's where he's made his home ever since, making a living as a writer and academic. It would be almost 30 years before he heard the name Bristrol Yotov again. In 2002, a um, small collection of my short stories was published by um, a publisher in California and uh, they invited me for publication lunch. And during this conversation, I knew that the man was uh, Gary Kern. He was my colleague. He had a doctorate degree from um, Princeton University, and he was a writer. And so I, I asked him, you know, like we talked around the table, what you're working on? And he said, well, I'm now writing a biography of a um, Soviet spy. And just to keep conversation going, I told him, yeah, you know, uh, I also met one Soviet spy some years ago. And said, what was his name? And I said, Dmitry Bristolyotov. And Gary froze and said, what? You met Dmitry Bristolyotov? Yes. Do you have notes of your meeting? He said, yes, I do. Oh, my God. You must write about your meeting. You're part of his biography. I said, what do you mean? All of a sudden, I'm part of somebody's biography. <laughs> Unbeknownst to Emil, in the intervening years, the life and work of Dmitry Bristrol Yotov had reached a wider audience. In 1999, the KGB defector, Vasily Mitrokhin, co-authored a book that gave the world unprecedented access to the Russian Secret Service's extensive archives. It was called the Sword and Shield, the Mitrokhin file. He brought out files of the Soviet intelligence working in the West for all these years, starting from 1920s on. And uh, there was, in this book, there was one chapter about Bistralyotov, so his name was known. Emil's curiosity, dormant for decades, was piqued once more. I was very curious and I started searching. Uh, I knew that the man died uh, actually a year and a half after our meeting. In May 1975, he died. But I start looking for his relatives. And uh, I remember the name of his second wife. And uh, little by little, I found online a telephone number of his step-grandson. So when I contacted him, I introduced myself and I said that I would like to investigate and write biography of Dmitry Bestolotov. He invited me to come to Moscow, and that's how it all started. In Moscow, Emil poured through Bristol Yotov's archives. Novels, memoirs, private diaries, all ripe for the picking. A life in pages. He gave me archives of his writing, and that helped me to know what really life of Mr. was all about. How the whole thing started, how he became a spy, and why he was, at the end of it, wanted to talk to somebody like me <laughs> to, to let the true story of his life to be known. So, let's tell that story. Sit back, relax, order a coffee, slice of strudel, oh, go on then. When in Berlin, do as Berliners do. A pretty young woman stares, antsily, out through the window of the cafe. She's waiting for someone. Eventually, her patience is rewarded. So as they were watched through a window of the cafe, the limousine would uh, drive up, 
and uh, came out a dashing, <laughs> handsome count, uh, well-dressed. The young count, for his noble bearing as plain for all to see, smiles nervously as he glides through the cafe's gilded entrance. And if you were sitting there too, a table or two away, perhaps, you might have overheard her asking him a question. Have you met Doris? Yes, there is a third member of this jolly little group. This woman was in her early 40s, and she was disfigured through accident in her early life to the extent that she was horrifically ugly. Doris, too, had someone special in her life. Maybe you've heard of him. She was ultra-Nazi. She was totally devoted. She adored Hitler. Ah, that's right. It is 1935. Doris is the keeper of some of Hitler's most valuable secrets. And the lovely young couple? Soviet spies determined to wrest them from her by any means necessary. The Count, as you probably surmised, is just one of many aliases maintained by the protagonist of this week's episode, Dmitri Bristrol Yotov. Let's leave the cafe for a moment. We'll be back soon. In the meantime, let's find out more about our mysterious aristocrat. Actually, to understand fully his motivations that were used for him to be recruited by the Soviet intelligence, you have to understand his main vulnerability. And his main vulnerability was to be an abundant child. It's 1901, in the city of Anapa. Dmitry Bristrolyotov begins life on an uneasy footing. Russian society is changing, and he is a social experiment. His mother was a suffragist, and she, with her girlfriend, also suffragist, decided to do something to prove to the society at that time, that we're talking about beginning of 20th century, that you can have a child out of wedlock, it's no big deal. How you do it? Nine months earlier, Dmitri's mother had offered this radical opportunity to a number of noblemen who holidayed in the city on the Black Sea. And at the age of three, he was sent to live with the Foster family. And the Foster home was of impoverished gentry family in St. Petersburg. During his time with his new family of faded aristocrats, Dmitri was unwittingly prepared for a future in intelligence work. Why? because he learned at least three foreign languages. It was custom at that time, English, French, German. Then he learned how to fence. He learned how to dance. He learned how to treat a lady in a high manner. It all became very handy in his future work, of course. He never even crossed his mind that would ever happen to him. Dmitri returned to Anapa to live with his mother at the age of 13. Their relationship, needless to say, was complex. At every juncture, her fervent dedication to social justice took priority over her son. And the civil war started. After World War I, civil war started and he wound up to be a sailor in the Black Sea. In this cold mess that happened at that time, not really knowing who is fighting whom and for what, he wound up to be with the white guards, with the military forces that opposed the takeover of power. He immigrated with them to Istanbul. In Istanbul, Dmitri's mental health, already somewhat fragile as a result of his upbringing, began to suffer. Before long, he was desperate to return to Russia. When he was in Istanbul, he came to the Soviet embassy and asked to come back. But he already was marked as being an enemy of the Soviet regime. The Soviet embassy denied his request. But that's not to say that they didn't see potential in him. After all, Dmitri was young, handsome, and educated, and he really wanted to go home. If you're a long-time listener to True Spies, you'll know that understanding somebody's primary motivations is essential to recruiting them. At that time, they already thought, they, I mean the Soviet intelligence, already thought, this is a prospect to be used in the West. So they say, you go with, with the flow, we'll contact you later on. Eventually, like many Russian emigres of the period, he washed up in Prague, the bustling capital of Czechoslovakia. And then at Prague, 
he again contacted the Soviet embassy and asking to come back. For him, kind of going back to mother, meant going back to motherland. Mother, motherland, that's the main desire that he had. But uh, he was told, well, you have to deserve to come back, to ask to allow back. Do something that, that proves that you're really loyal to your motherland. Do something that would prove to us that you're worthy of coming back. And that was the carrot that was in front of him for the whole time of, of his intelligence work. The Soviet intelligence service went by many names in the early years of the USSR. The Cheka, the GPU, the OGPU, the NKGB, the NKVD. Look, you get the picture. For consistency's sake, we use their most famous moniker, the KGB. You'll have to forgive the anachronism. At this point in history, the KGB had one thing on their minds, and they knew that Dmitry could help them get it. Probably would be important to describe the main target of spy work of Bistralyotov at that time. And the main target was diplomatic secrets. Ability to read diplomatic codes, to have access to diplomatic codes and ciphers, and ability to read diplomatic correspondence. Why? Because in mid-1920s, the international situation was full of ambiguity. Nobody knew how to handle at least two rogue states. Germany, after its defeat of an Versailles Treaty that was prohibited from having military development, and the Soviet Union. The old powers of Western Europe were deeply suspicious of the Soviet Union. So therefore, the diplomats of Western countries let's say French and uh, British, they tried to figure out what to do now. And the Soviets wanted to know what's going on. It's like playing cards and knowing the cards of your opponents. Before the age of the personal computer, every embassy had a pool of typists who would note down the musings, memos and diktats that make up diplomatic life. These typists were usually women. The KGB had correctly assumed that women tended to like Dmitry Bistrolyotov. In his prime, he was tall and handsome. Actually, when I met him, he gave me a kind of, a, in one sentence, the key of his success as a spy. He said, I was young, I was good looking, and I knew how to treat a lady. That's what he told me. In one phrase, he said it all. So he looked like maybe some people say like Clark Gable <laughs> in, in his prime. He was really sturdy, very strong. Remember, he was a sailor during the Civil War on, on the Black Sea. So he had a lot of physical prowess in him. Which brings us neatly to Dmitry's inaugural mission for the KGB. The first mission for him was to find a way to get hold of diplomatic secrets of France. There was a French embassy in Prague he, where he was. So he had to seduce a typist at the French embassy in order to get hold of uh, her, to provide her cooperation and uh, she would provide him with the copies of diplomatic uh, dispatches. Dimitri, unsurprisingly, was successful. The French typist passed along good information for months before the Russian ended the operation, breaking her heart in the process. So that was uh, his first um, action. And then the second one was he was able to penetrate School for Spies in Prague. They prepared, the Western alliances tried to learn something about the Soviet Union. So they recruited emigrants from white guards who left uh, after revolution. In this school, they kind of tried to brush up on the new slang that it comes in Russia and so on. In other words, to prepare them to go to the Soviet Union. So what Bistrolyotov did with, with his assistant, he simply <laughs> broke into the office and made a copy of the list of all students. So in other words, they already knew whatever information they had about these people and the Soviet intelligence already learned who possibly could come to the country for a spy. At the end of that operation, another resounding success. Dmitry once again pleaded with the Soviet embassy to allow him to return to Russia. But by now it was 1930, 
and new threats loomed in Europe. Joseph Stalin, now in full control of the Kremlin, was anxious that the Soviet Union should have advance warning of trouble from the West. And so, yet again, Dmitry Bristolyotov was denied his request, and the KGB sent him to Germany. Dmitry arrived in Germany under a new alias, Alexander S. Gallus, a Greek merchant. You see, Dmitry had become something of a master of disguise, operating a number of aliases, often on parallel missions. At one point, he posed as a Dutch artist, Hans Galeni, in another as a Brazilian merchant, in some other Yugoslav seasonal worker, as American businessman. Obviously, every time he changed his, uh, of course, dresses and, and uh, his uh, hairdo. And then eventually, probably the most known operations are under his alias of Hungarian Count, Lajos Joseph Pirelli. And it's under that name, Lajos Joseph Pirelli, that we find Dimitri on one of his most audacious missions. It begins in Berlin, five years after his arrival in the city. It should probably go without saying that the mid-1930s were a time of sweeping political change in that corner of Europe. According to the Versailles Treaties, Germany was prohibited to build up their military force to have more than 100,000 uh, uh, troops, uh, which was not even enough to defend uh, Germany, uh, prohibited conscription totally. But in 19, uh, 1933, as we know, in January, Hitler came to power. And in 1935, when he actually became Reichsfuhrer and the commander-in-chief, and therefore all German military officers and soldiers had to give pledge their fidelity to Hitler personally, to the Fuhrer. He became the Fuhrer. So he started rearmament of, of Germany. Obviously, it was a secret for the outside world. And here, the Soviet intelligence uh, sense that things are changing. So the Soviet um, spy ring in Berlin learned that secret orders for military equipment, tanks, artillery, aircraft, was given to various German factories and plants. But how much or what? It was important to learn. The Soviets discovered that the German military had designated a number of safe locations where sensitive military intelligence could be stored. One such location, disguised as the documentation department of a chemicals company, contained a safe. In turn, that safe contained information about the orders that Hitler had placed with weapons manufacturers. If the Soviets had that information, they'd know exactly what they were dealing with if the Nazis marched east. To guard this information, they appointed a member of SS who was, in their view, possibly the most enduring guard for all the secrets. Her name was Dorothea Müller, but she preferred Doris. Her colleagues at the SS had a different name for her. Cerberus. I didn't say it was a nice name. But Cerberus, the fearsome, impassable, three-headed dog which guards Hades in Greek mythology, was an appropriate namesake. Doris Müller was a fanatical Nazi. She was devoted to Hitler and was unlikely to be swayed by offers of cash or influence by a foreign power. She was also horribly disfigured, the result of a car crash in her youth. Her superiors imagined that her condition would make her impossible to seduce. After all, surely no foreign spy would be so crass as to feign romantic interest in Doris, they'd be laughed out of the room. Then they'd be led, quietly, into a different room and shot. So therefore, they felt very safe. So here's the task was given to Bistrolyotov, to find a way to get to this safe. And uh, in my estimation, this was one of his most astonishing operations, because he found a way gradually, not right away, gradually, to get the heart of this woman who would not be seducible in the kind of straightforward, the, the usual manner. Dimitri knew that Doris would be a hard nut to crack, 
even for someone with his natural charms. So he worked slowly, establishing a kind of shadow courtship with his unwitting target. And he started step by step. First, his assistant, who learned everything about the woman. They learned about her, that she lived alone, that she every day she would come from work and uh, have a supper in the local cafe. Usually she would sit at this particular table near the window. All this information was provided. For the next stage in the operation, Dimitri enlisted the help of a German-born agent who he recruited in Berlin. We'll call her Greta. Greta is young, stylish and beautiful. Greta walks into the cafe. Greta notices Doris and smiles shyly. She's all nerves, waiting for her date. Do you mind if I sit with you? Greta's date, Count Laish Joseph Pirelli, arrives. He smiles at Doris too, makes polite conversation. Here, Besserodov used one of his methods that, what to me is ingenious, that usually his target has to see him not from out of the blue, but step by step. This routine, girl meets woman, boy meets both, is repeated over the next few weeks. So in this situation, they gave like, Doris like a, a, a role of a approving mother of uh, the young love right in front of her developing and so on. Uh, so that's how Mr. Lodov introduced himself to Doris. Soon, Doris had formed a favorable impression of the handsome young Count. He was easy to like, wide-eyed, inquiring, and endearingly innocent. So in this particular case, he played the role of an outsider, of a Hungarian Count who was displaced because of the war, World War I, he lost uh, a lot of fortune. His uh, property back in Hungary is it's really in dismay. But he's supported by his aunt from America, and he's just traveling through Europe and uh, wondering what's going on about. And he pretended, actually, he played very skillful, not the first time, the innocent abroad card. Wherever he was, and whoever he was in the process of charming, Dimitri always played the outsider. Why? It was very, very important. Actually, when I talked to Mr. Lodov, he said to me, you never ever present yourself as being part of the country in which you operate. Because sooner or later, they not only accent, let's say you master the accent, but you say, I'm from such and such a town and say, oh, I, I also was from, oh, do, you, do you remember the, the mayor of the city or something of that sort? So he said, never ever, you're always an outsider. And he used his outsider status to weaponize the guiding light of Doris Mueller's lonely life. Nazism. He asked Doris, tell me, I understand it. Why is so much fuss about, what, what do you call it, Hitler, uh, Goering, uh, Goebbels? Well, in America, they, people would not really tell them apart. Doris was appalled. How was it possible that the Count could be so ignorant of the great men of the age? Such an aberration had to be remedied. So she started educating him, little by little. She brought him some brochures. She brought him, how come? You should know this bad. Dimitri had made Doris feel needed. And gradually, over the course of several weeks, a deep, almost spiritual connection bloomed between the two. Meanwhile, Greta quietly withdrew from the equation. Of course, this budding romance was completely one-sided. Eventually, in, even in his memoir, he writes that first time when he <laughs> kissed her, he, he shattered <laughs> because she was so unattractive. But it was necessary for the business at hand. The initial seduction complete, Dimitri was able to move on to the most crucial stage of his operation, the acquisition of secrets. He escalated his relationship with Doris claiming, tear-stricken, that he wanted nothing more than to marry her. Only, he didn't have the necessary funds. Unfortunately, the end doesn't give me enough money, and I need some more, and I don't know what to do. I really don't know. She said, well, don't worry. So it was fortunate, really, that Count Pirelli was due a stroke of good luck. One day, a telephone call came to the apartment of Doris, where Mr. Rota was. Obviously, it was arranged by the uh, Soviet uh, intelligence uh, ring. Uh, the phone call was from another, obviously, Soviet intelligence officer 
And Mr. Lotov listened to it, and she said, who, is, who was calling you? I said, well, it's actually, he's uh, my old man whom I know almost all my life. He was a manager of our estate. He was like my second uh, father after my father died. Well, he learned about my situation, and he wants to help me, but I don't know. He only said that the only possible way to get into some money is to play the stock market. Hitler's militarism had reinvigorated the economy. The German stock market had been revitalized after years in the doldrums. But stocks are by no means a surefire moneymaker. Well, not unless you have certain information. She said, what kind of information? Well, listen, I don't know much about it, Mr. Rolf said, but you know what, if we know what kind of orders are given to particular factories and plants, of heavy industry, then you can buy these stocks for law. And then when the order really come and they start producing, sell them high. So this is a typical kind of a stock operation. And then you can make money and really very good money. If that sounds like insider trading to you, then you're absolutely correct. But Doris did know which companies would be receiving wads of government cash in the very near future. And she did love Count Pirelli. So after a while, then Doris thought of it. And then one day she looked at the files. She remembered, of course, what kind of a, uh, information she has in, in, in this uh, safe. Like a seduction, the flow of information began slowly at first. First, she didn't bring any information in paper, just briefly telling him what kind of equipment was ordered uh, from Krupp, uh, from Farber Industry and so on or Junkers for the planes, of course. It was a good start, but it wasn't enough for the KGB. And then uh, said, you know, the banks are need, really need some documents uh, to give us money for the operation, to borrow money, to buy stocks. A simple formality, he assured her. Then one day she brought, uh, she said, only for, for two hours you have it. And they photographed it, of course, secretly from her. And so that's how gradually over the course of several months, they got the whole picture. Dimitri's efforts had paid off handsomely. And actually, yeah, I may sum it up, the whole four-year plan of rearmament of Germany was copied by the Soviet intelligence and sent to Moscow. Mission accomplished. Well, almost. There was just the small matter of a serious relationship with an SS officer to wrap up. But probably most important was how to break up the operation with uh, Doris without suspicion. Because if he would simply disappear one day, obviously she will call police, a uh, missing person. Then counterintelligence come in, they will gradually will come to it. Who was this man? How did and all that business? So they then did, in the center in Moscow decided to use the so-called newspaper variant, they call it. How to cut off with no suspicion. You've heard of ghosting, right? when your love interest goes unaccountably incommunicado. Rotten luck if it's happened to you. But we guarantee that you take a ghosting over the KGB's so-called newspaper variant any day of the week. First, Dimitri announced that with some money in the bank, he was ready to proceed with the wedding. But first, he would have to travel back to Count Pirelli's native Hungary to settle up with his creditors and put his beleaguered estate in order. Then their future would be secure. In a week after Mr. Lo's disappearance, there was a knock on the door of Doris' apartment and his friend, it's, uh, they call him Sir Battery, another Hungarian, quote unquote, but actually a Soviet spy, came very dismay and he had a clipping in his hand and said, what happened? Oh, good. I'm, I'm afraid I have a bad news. Then he gave it the clipping of newspaper in which it was in the column of the happening social events and so on. It was said that the Count Laish uh, Joseph Perelli was accidentally killed during hunting expedition. And his body was sent to his end in America. End of story. Tragedy had struck. Doris's beloved fiance the only man who had ever loved her was gone forever. Or so she thought. Few months later, Mr. Lotov had to come back to Berlin to meet another Soviet underground uh, intelligence officer. And they had a meeting in a cafe in one of the central streets of, of Berlin. And as he was 
coming into a cafe through the glass door, he saw Doris on the other side. Both of them froze. Nobody expected. She immediately fainted. She fainted. She couldn't believe that she, the man who, who the only hope for love ever in her life, who died, all of a sudden appears alive. She fainted, and the group of SS officers were nearby started to pick her up. But that was enough for him to get out, grab a taxi, and fly away. The KGB had their intelligence, and Dmitry Bristolyotov kept working, donning new guises and breaking new hearts in his long quest to return to the motherland. And he would stop at nothing. He was given a task. To me, it's probably one of his most important operations. Uh, the Soviet intelligence feeling that the war with Germany could happen any time, at least want to be prepared and know about the German underground uh, spy network in the Soviet Union. And they learned that actually French intelligence knew about it. They collected this data. And there was a French intelligence officer living in Switzerland who got hold of it. But the relationship between Soviet Union and France was kind of on uneven footing. They didn't fully trust each other. So it was important uh, to get copies of what really French uh, counterintelligence knows about the German spy network in Russia. But how to get it? And here, Mr. Lotov did the following. He told his wife that she has to sacrifice part of her personal life and do something that is important because otherwise they would never be able to come uh, back to Soviet Union, to country of his motherland. And the following operation was um, performed. Posing as a Hungarian aristocrat, Dmitri's long-suffering wife, yes, he was married, became close to a French intelligence officer, a portly, single, middle-aged man. She gradually got into relationship with him and he married her. Once he married her, then his wife was able to give access to Bistralotov. One night he actually climbed into the office of this state officer and opened the safe and copied all the information that he had about the spy work. Another successful mission. But at what cost? How far would you go to complete your objectives? Of course, it dramatically impacted his relation with his wife because she said when, when he offered her even, she said, okay, I'll do it, but I don't want to know you anymore. So she thought, if you can bring me as a sacrifice for, for your intelligent work, I don't want to do you anymore. Finally, Dmitri got his wish. In the last weeks of 1936, he was allowed to return to Moscow. He took a desk job at KGB headquarters. It was bad timing. The USSR was in the grip of what historians know as the Great Terror, a period of unmatched state repression. During this period, Stalin arrested, executed and imprisoned anyone who posed the slightest risk to his vision for Russia. KGB operatives of Dmitry's generation were a particular magnet for suspicion. And uh, it's my understanding that people who lived in the West they could not be totally <laughs> brainwashed into Soviet ideology because they knew other life that is much more complicated than the picture that was painted for the propaganda in, in their country. So therefore, practically everyone of his uh, um, colleagues and superiors were arrested. Fearing that his days might be numbered, Dmitry laid low. But Bistralotov, it just happened that he was not that careful in six or seven months, he made a phone call to the office, something about inquiring of some, of some document. And the man who picked up uh, the phone uh, reported on him. In his memoirs, Dmitri looked back on this moment with a twisted kind of relief. The stress of his impending doom had been too much. He was ready to meet his fate. He was brought to one of the prisons in Moscow and they want him to admit that he worked for six intelligence officers of the world, for Japanese, for British, for other, other. When Dmitri denied the charges, he was beaten mercilessly. The KGB got their confession. By the way, when I talked to him, he told me, and he said, everybody talks to them. Mind you, your tongue was September 1973. Still, he was beaten by... Uh, 
a ball bearing that broke on his back and one ball was lodged in his lungs at the time of our talking. That's what the long, long impact on his health of what really happened to him. Dmitry Bristrol-Yotov was sentenced to 20 years labor in the Gulag system, a sprawling network of camps where the USSR sent everyone from petty criminals to political prisoners. He'd served his country admirably, unquestioningly, for well over a decade. But in the end, he became just one of several thousand victims of Joseph Stalin's paranoia. For years, Dmitry had longed for his motherland, and now, not unlike his real mother, it had rejected him. Upon his release, he worked as a translator for medical texts. By that time, polyglots like Dmitry were a relative rarity in the isolated realm behind the Iron Curtain. What really saved him is again his background, his being brought up in an aristocratic family, knowing languages. Around 22 languages, actually, by the time his career was over. But ultimately, his was not a happy ending. When he died of heart failure in 1975, he left the world a disappointed man. When eventually Germany attacked Soviet Union in June of 1941, at that time, Bustaruta was already in Gulag. And when he learned about it, he was totally broken up because how come I gave my government already plan what's going to happen in four years? How much tanks, how much planes, how much uh, artillery Germany will have? How come they did not prepare? He felt that nothing of what he actually, with the risk of his life, got for the government was used. He was totally disappointed. And he wrote in his memoir that was never published, but I saw it with my own hands. Bitter disappointment that everything that he and other Soviet spies in the West risked their life to get was nothing was used. Everything was love to the motherland. All their efforts were wasted and they were thrown into, into mud. That's literally, I translate what, from Russian what he wrote. These lines were never ever published in the Soviet Union. That's why my book came out in America, then in Great Britain, then was translated into Polish, which never was published in Russian. We've only told some of Dmitry Bristol-Yotov's incredible story this week. He was one of history's greatest spies, a tortured Russian proto-bond who infiltrated the mightiest governments of the age and looked good doing it. If you'd like to learn more, it's all in Emil Dreitzer's book, Stalin's Romeo Spy, The Remarkable Rise and Fall of the KGB's Most Daring Operative. It's available in print and as an ebook now. I'm Vanessa Kirby. Here's a taste of next week's top secret encounter with true spies.